Good afternoon. My name is uh, Helmi Abulaj. I'm uh, from Egypt. And uh, I want to take you to, to Egypt today in the afternoon. And I want to speak uh, with you about uh, a project actually my father started 33 years ago in the Egyptian desert. Uh, and uh, how is this relevant to the topic of entrepreneurship? Basically, it's relevant to the topic of entrepreneurship because I believe when he started 33 years ago with this project, it was one of these projects which didn't have a lot of credibility amongst investors. People did not believe that this, uh, this idea will ever survive uh, the first uh, few weeks or months because it was about how to reclaim the desert. Okay? Let me, before I go to Egypt, give you a quick uh, overview about the state of the world as I see it, as my father saw it. And I have to tell you that I joined my father very early in 82. So I'm uh, since 28 years now part of the second development. And uh, I'm not really the second generation. I'm somehow the first and a half generation or something like this. But anyhow, what is it what I would like to, to, to share with you? Uh, the world is facing a lot of huge challenges in this 21st century. Many, many of them uh, have been mentioned over the last one and a half to two days. I would like to focus on some of the challenges related to agriculture. Agriculture still employs half of the population of Egypt's uh, workforce. And agriculture, obviously, as we know, is feeding us all. And uh, also, it only has a very small part of the GDP. It is very, very important. Food security and food sovereignty are issues which are discussed everywhere, because we are 6 billion or 6.8 billion today, and we will be 9 billion. And how are we going to feed our future generations? So water, actually, is the biggest short-term challenge of this century for the Arab region. As you may know, <laughs> those who are living in the region, we are all living below the poverty line of, of water. What is the poverty line of water? Every one of us needs per day about 3,000 liters of water to eat virtual water in our food. So our consumption per day is 3,000 liters of water in rice, meat, and other food stuff. We only drink three, four, five liters, and maybe use at home 20, 50, 60, 70 liters, but we eat 3,000 liters. So this means that in any country where you don't have 3,000 by 365, about 1,000 cubic meter per head, you will not be able to feed your population. Okay? You have to import water in the form of corn, mice, soya, whatever else, but you cannot feed your own population. Now, in Egypt, we are currently at 800 cubic meters. We will be 500 when our population is going to be 100 million and more in 12 years. We are currently 80 million. So we are living below the poverty line, and water is going to be one of the issues we have to face. Uh, I know for a fact that the Arab world, Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, and other countries in the region are living below 500 cubic meters. So their problem is even much back, bigger. Now, the other big uh, challenge, uh, obviously, and we know that all our countries, including Egypt, the Emirates, and all the other countries, signed in Copenhagen on a statement saying that the biggest of all challenges of this century is climate change. Climate change is going to change the world dramatically over the next 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, and we all know uh, that, um, that we currently are at emitting about 50 gigatons of CO2, mostly by generating energy, industries, and about 25% in agriculture and forest management. So agriculture is part of the problem, but it's not acknowledged as part of the solution up till now in climate treaty. Now, we know also, this is a McKinsey study, that within the next 25 years, until 2030, if we go on as we are, we will reach 70, 70 gigatons, OK? So it will go up. Our emissions are going up because the developments of all of our countries need more energy, fossil fuel, and so on and so on, which will emit more. But we all are committed to a target. The target says we should reduce our emissions from 50 
to 38 gigatons, which means we actually, instead of going up, we should go down. And to reach this, we have to acknowledge some issues. One, every sector in the world, energy, industry, and agriculture, have to reduce CO2 emissions. Every sector. And agriculture is very, very important. This is the potential. 38 gigatons we have to reduce in agriculture. So this is a big, big objective of agriculture in the world. At the same time, we also have to acknowledge that every country from the USA to the Middle East have to contribute. It's not enough anymore if only one, two, or three big industrialized nations, Europe, Japan, and United States, would do a good job. Every country has to contribute. We have to contribute. Even if we are not the reason, politically, it doesn't, uh, doesn't matter for me. For me, important, we have to do something. Now, what is it what my experience can contribute to this, to this issue of the challenges and how can agriculture contribute? The first thing is that when we started 30 years ago in Sekem, my father had a, a dream, and this is why I'm saying a dream which sounded a mission impossible then, to convert desert into arable land. And this is a farm. This is the first building in 1979 on Sekem desert, as you can see. This is how it looks like today. This was one of the first fields, and this is like how it looks like today. So what happened there over the 30 years is a kind of a miracle. A miracle where really organic agriculture, sustainable agriculture, was able to prove that we could transform desert into arable land. We could produce food, healthy, and uh, uh, enough food for our people, and employ people. Now, what is, what is the idea? The idea, the innovative idea, and entrepreneurship always has to do something with innovation, was that organic farming embedded in a sustainable community development will make it possible to be more efficient than conventional agriculture, which is a big claim, because every one of you knows that organic agriculture is expensive, produces less, it's, it's small scale. It will never be able to feed the whole world, and so on. So the idea that by investing not only in the economic side of, of the life, but also on the cultural side and the social part, we will be able to be efficient and competitive with organic agriculture by introducing something called fair trade. Some of you may have heard about it in the Western world. It's a label today. In 33 years ago, it was not even existing. Fair trade means that everyone, from the farmer to the consumer, gets a fair part of the added value. Another idea to develop a local market for organic products in Egypt. You have to imagine the GDP per capita in Egypt is currently at $1,400. Europe, 30,000 euros. Uh, and uh, the United States, $40,000. So how can you develop an organic market in, in, a, in a developing world? And another idea my father had from the very beginning to say we will not only uh, reclaim land with organic agriculture, we will not only will distribute the added value, which we still don't have, huh? we have desert up till now, and we will sell it to the local market. But beside this, he also said, and we have to invest into our community. Corporate social responsibility was a new idea in 77. And to say that you are going to be more efficient by investing into your people seemed totally impossible. It's added cost, not added efficiency. But he also said we are going to invest into our people by giving them 10% of their working time for free for their own education. Now, again, all this sounds, and if you hear it now as an investor, then the idea doesn't seem to be very competitive. But not enough, he said, and by, because we need innovation to prove that we are more efficient, we want to invest into innovation and research and development. So you start in the desert with organic farming, and then you start to distribute the profit you don't have to the community, to your people, to innovation, 
And if I stop here and tell you, would you put your money into this project 70, 33 years ago, I'm sure the majority of you would not. It seems to be a mission impossible. And this is exactly how most of entrepreneurial ideas start. Now, if we go and look what happened over the last 33 years, today, biodynamic agriculture in, in Egypt and the whole region is developing very fast at 20, 30 percent per year. About 1 percent of Egypt's arable land today is organic, uh, about 70,000 acres out of 7 million acres. It's growing, as I said, at 20 percent. And it was able to employ thousands of farmers and their families with a better livelihood than the conventional farmers. And not only this, it was also able to prove that organic agriculture actually is using less water at the same era, area and with the same yield. So if we use 40 to 70 percent less water because we create living soils, this means that this would, for a country like Egypt, enable us to reclaim millions of acres of more land. And not only this, over the last 30 years in our agricultural system, we sequestered, stored in our soils, one million tons of carbon. And I just I want to remind you, one of the big issues is how can we sequester carbon to stop climate change? So organic agriculture in Egypt is contributing to stopping climate change. Now, not only this, we were also able to prove that we do not need energy. We do not need fossil fuel energy. We are using renewable energy. We are using 13 percent less uh, energy than conventional farmers do. And last not least, we employ 20 percent more people on the same area for the same production. Egypt's biggest internal problem today is unemployment. One million young Egyptians are coming to the job market, and only four or five hundred thousand are finding a job. So if agriculture could employ millions of, of these young Egyptians, then this would be a great opportunity to have a meaningful life for them. So our agricultural system proved to be competitive to conventional farming at competitive prices. Now, this on the farming side, but the whole idea to create products for the local market did not stop at the farm. Because we all are used to go to supermarkets and pharmacies to buy our products in Egypt, in Sekem, over the last 30 years, we had to create companies to take our biodynamic and organic products and add value through processing to produce foodstuff, organic cotton, uh, ready-made garments, and pharmaceutical products from medicinal herbs to sell them to our clients in Egypt. We today have about 2,500 people working in these companies. We are serving millions of customers. We are market leaders as some of my colleagues from Egypt can tell you, in herbal tea, for example, we are producing about 500 million tea bags of organic herbal teas, which are sold mainly in Egypt and the region. 73% of everything we produce goes to Egypt and the region. So we succeeded to establish a local market. Obviously, this needs a lot of continuous investment. This needs a lot of quality management systems like organic fair trade certification, global organic textile standard certification. Recently, we started for our clients in Europe to introduce carbon neutral products, for example. We are measuring the carbon footprint of every product from the farm to the shelf. And today, while I'm speaking, we are doing the first water footprints of our products to prove to final customers, for you, that you can buy a product from an organic source with less CO2 and less water, which is an important factor in the future. Now, still, the question is, what are the reasons that this system worked and that 2,500 people are there and we are growing at 20 percent? I will mention only three of them. One, my father's idea from the very beginning was that we have to link ourselves to the world. We have to link ourselves to academia, politicians, civil society, partners everywhere in Egypt and the world. Today, Egypt is part of a huge network. We are able to do what we do because we have friends in Germany, we have friends in the United States, in South Africa, in Brazil, who are working with us, developing our systems with us. 
selling our products, selling us their raw materials. We believe that only by linking to the global uh, world, by getting the synergy of different cultures, different inputs, different technologies, we were able to reach. And without the support of our international friends and partners, we would have not done this miracle. But there is another component which is also very, very important. And you all know this from your own experience. In, a, in whatever organization or community, you will have to, 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 to handle the issue of how can the three of us produce products which 30 single people could not produce. The idea of a team is that it can produce more than everyone alone can produce. So how can one and one be 10 is one of the ideas every organization has to handle in a way. In our, way, in our community, SECAM, where our 2,000 people are living in, like a community, like a family, are meeting daily in circles, are speaking to each other, are self-motivated, and in the end are ready to give more than our competitors outside uh, of SECAM are, one of the major success factors are these people. Everyone alone, and the 10% of their time means that at any time in Tekem, 200 of our people are not working. You can have to imagine, 10% of their time. Huh? And still, our productivity is higher than of anyone in the same industry in Egypt at the same time. And all of them together are doing miracles as a team. And last but not least, the issue of corporate social responsibility. I mean, as I said in the beginning, part of the dream was to say we create a community not only with our own employees, but with the surrounding people. And we have about 13 villages around us where 30,000 people live. And we supply them with schooling, a kindergarten, a vocational training center, adult education programs, a medical center, a research center, and inshallah, up from September 2011, a university for sustainable development where thousands of kids are educated, their parents working with us or not working with us, are feeling that this community is part of what they do. And corporate social responsibility may, at the first sight, look as if it's additional expenses. Our experience is that it's one of the reasons of our success, that our people around us are carrying us, are caring for us, and are part of the big family. Now, uh, the Heliopolis University is a very important element, because the question is, where do we go from here? What is going to be our succession plan? What is going to be the next 20 or 30 years? We believe that our only hope are the next generations, our kids and their kids. And hence, this university for sustainable development, where kids and students will be educated in organic agriculture, in social entrepreneurship, in phytopharmacy, in water management, in renewable energy management, and so on and so on, is going to be a very important investment, again, into the far future, but part of the SECAM idea, and hopefully spreading this idea in Egypt and the region. Now, the question, uh, you may say that this is all nice. It's a small, uh, small example. Can it be multiplied? Can it be done in quick uh, terms everywhere in the world, everywhere in the Arab world? I believe yes. And to give you one example, two years ago, we started in a new land reclamation project in the Sinai region, which is the Asian part of Egypt, where, as you can see, uh, it doesn't look at the first sight uh, a very uh, arable, lies, smooth land, a lot of sandstorms, sandy soils, and so on and so on. The first trees were planted in 2008, here, you can see. And after only 18 months with compost and the organic agriculture, this first peanuts were harvested, 18 months. So what I want to say to, to conclude and give you a chance, give us a chance to interact, I believe that this vision, this idea, which was the idea 33 years ago, ob obviously evolved. And what I can see today, that we have actually here a recipe for a contribution to a better future a contribution to stopping climate change, to handle the water scarcity issue, to handle the fossil fuel uh, um, 
issue because we all know we will not face, have the same fossil fuel in the future. And it needs passionate people, self-motivated people, obviously. And it needs a continuous investment into the future. It needs innovation, human equity, and investment into a future which is not 100% linked to us because schooling and, and university are not 100% linked. But I believe with these new ideas based on ethics, a certain business ethics, uh, these uh, huge challenges can be handled. I think that it is exactly an example for what entrepreneurship can give to us to handle the mission impossible, to get new innovative solutions, and to create a better future. And this is what especially social entrepreneurship is all about. So in this regard, I hope uh, we can interact now in, a, in, a, in, a, in the remaining uh, 17 minutes to maybe to give you some more inputs into how social entrepreneurship in Egypt is look, looking like. And I hope uh, that I could inspire some of you, and uh, I hope also that we all together can do something uh, to meet here again in 20 years and achieve this in all of our lands. Thank you very much. Ra uh, Ita uh, I just wanted to say that to me, Ibrahim Abu Aish is a hero and a social entrepreneur, the archetype of a social entrepreneur. Because what they were do, what you were doing in 1976, I think, 77. when you started in 1977, uh, long before we had, so we were talking. It was a buzzword to talk about social entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship in the region. And uh, I buy all the ISIS project uh, products in the organic supermarket uh, here and etc. But one of the things with Sikkim is that. As a model, as a as a model that you the, uh, sort of a, that you can plug into other Arab countries, I, I, I I'm not finding it uh, being rolled out as fast as it should be. That's uh, number one. And number two, how is how are you working on you know intra-Arab sort of collaboration with regard to organic farming and uh, and, the, and, the, and these sort of projects? Thank you. We are working uh, with most of the Arab countries, from Morocco to, uh, to Iran even. But uh, uh, you are right, and this is why I'm here, and this is why I, today in the morning, woke up very early to go on this flight, and tonight I'm going back, because I think we need more social entrepreneurs to pick on these ideas. In the end, it will not only rely on us. We have an open tour, and if you want to come tomorrow, you are most welcome, and we will show you everything, and we will also support you. And we are doing this in Lebanon, we are doing this in Sudan, we are doing this in Uganda and Tanzania and other countries where we are already sourcing some of our products. But in the end, it's all about this entrepreneur, the, the one or the team of entrepreneurs who want to take such an idea to a next level. And to convince them, I'm making this presentation, I want to tell everyone that this is a visible business model for the 21st century. It's not only a nice one, but it's a competitive one. And uh, it can uh, also create livelihoods for those who are involved and for thousands of people around it. But it needs entrepreneurs. And we are not the ones who want to manage uh, by remote control from Egypt farms anywhere in the Arab world. There, we have enough to do with our own farms in Egypt. We are giving it to anyone today. And uh, we are giving it uh, to uh, young students. We have uh, internship programs, many, many students. We have about 50, 60 students uh, doing their six to one years internship in, in SACEM from the region, from Europe, from the United States, from other places. We are giving programs, lectures, trainings to anyone all the time. And we are happy, uh, if you know someone, to, to support them. Okay. Hi again. <laughs> um, I have a comment and a question. The comment is, um, I've been inspired by SACOM since uh, the year, uh, I was 12. The first agricultural feat actually I, I've seen was in SACOM. And I've, I had the, the honor to work with you for a year in SACOM as well. And I think that you're undermining your efforts by saying that you have corporate social responsibility because this is not something extra you do. Actually, responsibility is part of your DNA in the company. So, and I don't think also it's social entrepreneurship. I think it's more than that. So, 
uh, I think it's not about corporate social responsibility. What you are doing is totally social. It's not about giving back to the community or doing something for the community from the very beginning. So this is just a comment. My question is, and um, you know, in, in Egypt we have crisis uh, of water, especially like already we have crisis, and of course after the Ethiopian crisis, well, we were facing. Uh, more and more crisis in the, in the coming years. And I'm really um, intimidated by the fact that people are talking about the crisis in water uh, and that agriculture is consuming a huge part of the water, as you said, and they're not taking SACOM initiative or the solution that SACOM introduced 30 years ago. So I was wondering, I know that you are lobbying uh, for years and years to adopt the SACOM model in Egypt, but I want to know, is there any result that the Egyptian government can adapt, adopt the second model so we can solve the problems we have in Egypt? Thank you. I, I, I think the whole summit here is about the answer. I think the answer has to come from entrepreneurs. Governments, by the way, in the United States, in Egypt, and in Japan, are always not very far looking, are always looking to the next elections have their own issues and priorities, which are unfortunately not looking into 20, 30 years uh, of, of challenges. Um, my hope is that more and more private sector entrepreneurs will come up and do it. Because if we were able to do it in, in SECAM, every one of you can do it in his sur surrounding in any other country. And if more and more of us are doing the right thing, this will change Egypt. My hope that the government uh, is going to change Egypt is getting less every day. But the only thing, and this is why I'm lobbying, as you know, is to make sure that they are at least not going to hinder us, which is already a big achievement, because currently they are subsidizing and incentivizing the wrong behavior. They are giving electricity to, for, for cheap money, and then they are speaking about energy saving and energy efficiency. <laughs> Nobody will save energy which is for free. They are giving water for free, and they know that we don't have enough water. And then my, my better water consumption is not being paid by anyone. My products are looking more expensive. So the interesting issue is, what I'm lobbying for is I'm telling them I am cheaper. Organic agriculture is cheaper if you would factor in water and energy and CO2 emissions and, and, and reductions and health impact and environmental impact. And governments should actually help us to show only this and we do the right thing. Currently, they are showing always the wrong thing. So my hope is that you do something, <laughs> but not our government. Um, I'm Aiga Hala from Egypt. Uh, I've been to Sikkim, and, and I know the story since um, Dr. Ibrahim was in Germany and, and how he started the project and, and how live it goes there. Um, um, the fields, housing, and the employees, the sustainability is not only on the projects, but also I saw some employees, they have been working there for thir 30 years and since the beginning, and they're still there. Um, I know that you are supporting uh, um, new people that want to start such a project. Um, before, the, uh, to transfer the, um, uh, the soil into organic, it was taking so much time, and it, I think it differs now. And with the compatibility, do you think is it easy um, to, to enter uh, the market and, and to build another SECAM? Or it's, it's not going to work as it, um, um, it was with SECAM because there, there are, um, uh, it, it was less compatibility before, but now there are um, uh, many competitors and it's growing because it became easier than before. Does it work or the compat compatibility? Um, allowed to, to, to enter new people in the market? I, I think it was much more difficult 33 years ago. Today, customers, consumers all over the world are asking for this kind of product. The demand is rising faster than the supply. Okay? So I think the market can take many, many more entrepreneurs in this field. But what is, what is, what is very important, what I just mentioned now, I believe that within the next five to 10 years maximum, Everyone will see that organic products are cheaper. So the world will turn into organic products not because of philosophy, ideology, of good things. They will do it because they cannot afford to go on putting a lot of fossil fuels into food, putting a lot of water, and they don't have water into food, and, uh, and, and emitting CO2. So I think it's getting easier. And when we meet here in 10 years, organic is going to be mainstream. 
So just, uh, just do it. Well, it's uh, Bessel Moshur from Egypt. And uh, I have a bakery business in Egypt, and I think we are working in, uh, in a partnership project with your respectable company, developing uh, organic, organic bread. bread. Yeah. But you're too, too slow. We need the products tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we're working <laughs> yeah, on okay. it. But I think we reached uh, some solid know, grounds in that. I know. Thank you very much. Um, but I really, when I think about it by myself, I have this dilemma of what good would it make if I consume one organic loaf of bread and in the same day I'm consuming a thousand of unorganic uh, food? Um, if I'm asked this question, I really don't have an answer for it. So I would really appreciate to get your views on that. I think our Sekem is an example that in a world where it looks very difficult, by doing the right thing yourself, you are changing the world. Huh? And we have to have the belief that it's not our government and it's not anyone outside of our government changing the world. We can do it. If every one of us does the right thing tomorrow morning, the world will look different. Huh? So your one loaf and my one loaf together are changing the future. And if we can get more and more people doing the right thing, this is the beginning of a, of a new era. So I'm, uh, I'm very much optimistic that we can, by starting doing the right things, change the impact on the long term. And we should not look to the others. One thing I learned over the last 30 years is start by yourself. Do the right things. And don't wait others to do the right thing. Uh, help me. Tariq uh, Khalil, where is the water for the Sinai is coming from, and how mo much water is there, actually? Uh, in, in the Sinai uh, development here, the water is coming from the Nile, below the Suez Canal. It's coming from the Ismailia Canal, actually. Um, but it differs. In Egypt, the major source of water, obviously, is the Nile water. But you have also one of the biggest aquifers in the world, the Nubian aquifer, in the western part. And you have the under-soil uh, under Nile which comes with the Nile and goes some kilometers left and right. So on different places, in different developments, we are using different sources of water. And obviously, with technology, and it's, this, it's Nile water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, we have enough water, but again, looking into the future, we have to make sure that everyone around us and everyone in Egypt is going to go to this form of agriculture to make sure that we can reclaim more. Otherwise... We have to reclaim less. Thank you, Helmi. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I, I hope uh, I will be around. So if someone has a question, I'm happy to answer them one to one.